Good morning, everybody. Uh, I think our panel is a perfect follow-on to the really interesting remarks uh, by Mr. Blackburn. Uh, I think that our topic is great power competition is this kind of unifying theme, if you will. So for me, great power competition is kind of at the macro level of how does the Intel community think about the priorities of any administration and how does uh, the analytic work and the collection work fit into this new framing, if you will. As was mentioned earlier in the day, you know, that, that Bill Nolte, I think, the transition from a sort of organizing principle around terrorism that lasted for basically 20 years has now transitioned to a world of, some people say, the return to geopolitics or really fitting into Linda's theme of Back to the Future, that some of these concepts uh, return they, uh, in a cyclical way. So our, uh, we selected these presentations in part because they fit into that very kind of broad theme of great power competition. What we heard from Mr. Blackburn is that competition plays out in lots of different ways. Traditional intelligence would have been largely focused on military threats, peer adversaries that could, and sort of envisioning a kind of, uh, you know, warfare scenarios in which the threats were uh, measured in part by the military capabilities of other countries with economics and technology, um, even ideology and you know, demography and, and lots of other factors. We have lots of different ways of measuring uh, where, how countries compete and what do they compete over, what are the tools they use to compete. And um, while in my own career, I'd spend about half of my government career in the intelligence community, I was part of the folks in the National Intelligence Council who did kind of strategic analysis. So it was really political analysis that included competition, big trends in the world, etc. cetera. Um, and so eventually in this panel, we may get to those sort of broader comparative political questions. But what I'm really impressed with in the presentations this morning is how people really understand very concretely how does geopolitical competition play out? Uh, so in, in very um, almost material ways, what are some of the challenges that the intelligence community uh, is really compelled to get more expert on? Um, and I think we heard uh, from Mr. Blackburn that there are still gaps because some of these issues, sort of their center of gravity resides in parts of our government that are not the intelligence community. They may reside in the health community or the catastrophic weather community. This is something DHS, the intelligence office of DHS had to grapple with right at the beginning in the early 2000s when that agency was formed, that the, um, the knowledge, uh, the sort of primacy of knowledge management didn't reside in the IC on some of the topics that DHS uh, grapples with. So I think you're gonna find in these presentations a really interesting mix of, of topics where Probably the IC is not does not have a monopoly on knowledge of those topics, but they are certainly identified as relevant to the big questions of geopolitical competition. So we're going to start with Anthony Amos from George Mason uh, on lithium, a very practical uh, problem set that certainly Mr. Blackford already talked about. Amanda Verdun from NIU will go next on climate change and the Chinese uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Johnny Davis will look at messaging in cognitive warfare, a really interesting and original topic, I think. And we'll wrap up with uh, Carlos Alator right here of IWP. Uh, he's been behind the scenes for this whole program, and today, we're, we're, for this panel, we're putting him up on center stage. Um, and he's looking at China's space ambitions. So when we think of geopolitical competition in theory, there's Russia and China, but I think you will find in this panel that is um, all China all the time. So. Uh, anyway, you can prepare your questions to see if our panelists can uh, can kind of widen their focus a little bit, but we'll, um, I think you'll really have a very interesting set of presentations. We are going to lose Anthony Amos to has to return uh, to work, so what I'm going to do is have Anthony present, and then we'll open up for questions just for him, uh, and then we'll move forward with the rest of the panel. Okay. Yeah, my apologies for being the lame duck on this one. I got a great segue from Mr. Blackburn, so I appreciate that alley-oop. 
Uh, friends, my name is Anthony Amos, and I'm here to tell you about China's plan to control the world by being the gatekeeper to what has been called white petroleum. And they've been succeeding with very little opposition from the U.S. and our allies. But let's dial it back. Show of hands, who here owns an electric vehicle? How about a laptop or a cell phone? Yeah, I figured as much. For those who didn't, more power to you. Uh, you see your devices, newer technologies, our renewable energy infrastructure, our electric grid, especially with the expansion of data centers. They are part of a growing security crisis. Not just chips, as was noted earlier. According to the Department of Interior, rare earths or minerals like lithium, the topic of today's presentation, not the Nirvana song affect your daily life and drive the function of governmental operations. As a matter of fact, consumption of lithium skyrocketed by 60% in 2019 and continues to grow at an annual compound rate of 30%, driven by our increased dependency on technology and lithium ion batteries. That makes us, for lack of a better analogy, a race between a hare and a tortoise. We're rocking our mighty green shell, and China is hopping along at a very, very frighteningly fast pace. President Jinping's One Belt, One Road initiative, also known as BRI, spurred their investment into foreign economic opportunities and expanded their control on the supply chain. Their financial and investment strategies were said to rival that of the World Bank in terms of lending and purchasing. Over 60 countries have signed on to BRI to date, generating $26.4 billion in revenue via trade contracts and uh, resource taxes, including on different minerals. This includes the use of low interest loans to inflate costs and create debt traps for contractors. Their focus on exploration and mining processes put them far in the lead before we fully knew there was a race <clears throat> They've consolidated control of the rare earths industry, and that has garnered them political favor while capitalizing on debt. So how about some examples? The largest identified lithium mines in the world were deemed to be in South America, Australia, and the eastern provinces of China. To access the largest region known as the Lithium Triangle between Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile, production and mining deals were established. These supply deals disrupt the ability of transatlantic partnerships to grow in the mineral industry and decreases the risk of competition for the CCP. It also places debt obligations on developing nations that rely on China for sensitive infrastructure and renewable energy opportunities. Critical assets are surrendered, seeing cases like Sri Lanka's 99-year lease uh, with, with, uh, with China on Hamban to report. This extends into their Western provinces, the Middle East, Central Asia, and beyond. It constricts accessibility within the market and subjects the host country to the economic will of the entity that owns them. This trickles down into our private industry partners too. Tesla and Ford have long-term supply contracts with foreign subsidiaries to mitigate lithium scarcity here in the United States. You may have seen recent reports of Taiwan's concern with that with Elon Musk. This bolsters the Chinese economy as they increase their lithium mine out output and refinement process. For additional context, manufacturing and mining account for one third of China's gross domestic product. It serves as an explanation for China's relatively high annual growth rate in recent memory and how they managed to expand nearly three times faster economically than the United States in recent, uh, in recent decades. This geopolitical crisis is set to reach a point of no return post-2050, as the monopolized control of lithium lowers supply chain resilience capability, meaning we will reach a point where we cannot keep up with demand as consumption exponentially grows. The US and Europe struggle because of our low capability to mine and produce lithium since supply is largely located outside our borders. The extraction process is also very expensive and time consuming. We largely rely on imports and have greater concern with the social and environmental repercussions of lithium extraction. Research has noted that lithium extraction has high toxicity potential, 
pollutes water resources, and damages fertile lands. Mining specifically creates excess waste and often displaces many indigenous peoples that are located near those access points. For example, Portugal is the biggest European potential producer for lithium, yet must contend with the criticisms surrounding the process and their associated policies. Who has heard of NIMBYs? It's an industry term, not in my backyard. They and indigenous peoples tend to oppose these types of projects, like in Thacker Pass, Nevada, where we have a proposed lithium uh, mine to, uh, to, to move forward, yet the project has been halted due to strong public opposition. Specifically, it's not just resource scarcity, but the management of resource exploitation. The Chinese government does not have the same restrictions as the West. Their authoritarian rule and control over media silences the dilemmas faced across the ocean, like social and environmental concerns. They are not bounded and operate freely, regardless of citizen opinion. Local and state regulations impact us, not them. So we're, we're over halfway through the race and uh, we're, we're getting woke pretty bad, so what do we do? The power disparity in this industry can be disrupted by technological innovation. Three things come to mind. Lithium ion battery recycling, everyone's favorite key phrase these days, artificial intelligence, specifically when it comes to mapping, and direct lithium extraction, also known as DLE. We need to increase investment into promoting a circular economy by improving the efficiency of battery storage. Lithium ion batteries are expensive, especially since we rely on imports and it has gotten worse post pandemic. Currently the reuse process produces excess that is difficult to dispose of and does not yield much lithium in return. Only 5% of lithium ion batteries are properly recycled, resulting in over 200,000 tons of waste. If this process is refined, the resiliency of lithium grows and would lead to savings of upwards of 70%. We can explore options for tax deductions on those who recycle batteries, and we can expand production domestically, promoting competition and public-private partnerships. Get them back over here. But recycling does not go far enough. Breaking our over-reliance on imports is just as critical, something we are doing right now enter in artificial intelligence. The implementation of AI allows us to find resources significantly faster, maintain consistent ventilation systems, and map out potential locations for crucial resources. Through historical exploration and geological survey analysis, vendors are employing algorithms to identify ore hotspots, reducing the cost of operations, garnering investors by improving their ESG scores, and improving overall production with better safety. It is also identifying more powerful alternatives to key resources. Prototype batteries are being created without lithium, thanks to supercomputing, condensing 20 years worth of lab research into nine months. And while that's in development, direct lithium extraction is allowing us to open new mines while mitigating pollution-related concerns. North Carolina, Canada, and a massive, massive lithium deposit discovered last year along the Nevada-Oregon border that may revolutionize the supply chain, holding 20 to 40 million metric tons. That would be the largest lithium mine in the world. And now DLE can let us attract it. It uses less space and water while decreasing waste using geothermal heat. It is considered a cost-friendly option that results in more yield with greater purity. We're not in the lead, but we've caught our second one. One of our key security goals for energy independence is to close the deficit. Europe is attempting to innovate and read consumptive technologies for strategic autonomy, and some of our legislators are seeking to break this monopoly through policy to back up research and development. As mentioned earlier, the Ore Act, CHIPS Act, the 21st Century Manufacturing Act, and the Bill of Builds Act all emphasize countering BRI by investing in U.S. technological infrastructure growing our export operations, and creating a more technical workforce. So a lot of this sounds good when I say it, after the doom and gloom I gave. But we need to understand the urgency of this matter. Unlike the hair, 
China will not get cocky and take a break. And you contribute to the problem. Did someone take a picture today? Did you play PlayStation? Did you watch YouTube? Did you drive a car, maybe an electric vehicle, or take public transit, which is becoming increasingly more electric? If unobstructed, any decarbonization effort will be controlled by China, leading to price volatility from premiums, worsened logistical issues in the supply chain, and higher risk for social and political conflicts, both domestically and internationally. You are here because you love this country and recognize that like the tourists, we overcome your ingenuity. We face a faster opponent. We have one chance to get this right, so please persevere, prosper, and prepare. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anthony. So as I said, uh, he's gonna have to leave in 10 minutes, so I want to invite any questions just for him right now. Uh, I hope somebody will uh, take him on on his very provocative and creative uh, presentation. Don't get shy on me now. Yeah. <laughs> Did I do that good of a job? Okay, there we go. Andrew Rogers with NIU um, and the IC uh, community. I concur wholeheartedly with everything. Um, there's a choke point in the processing. There's the extraction. Processing is also extremely toxic to Correct. the universe. So that's we see almost, or at least my research, it's exclusively done in China. Uh, is there an effort to promote the refinement in the U.S.? Is that a part of your So, yes, there is. The main issue is that we still need the resources to refine it. So developing those technologies is in place. For example, I mentioned earlier, they're trying to develop uh, alternatives to, to lithium as well. So it's both expanding lithium production and trying to get innovative with what resources we can make without having to uh, push forward lithium. So we're aware of our exposure in that regard. However, it's difficult to do when we still uh, to really get to the nitty gritty. We still need the lithium to come. So it's, it's a cycle, they almost go hand in hand together. It's a chicken and egg situation. If we end up uh, extracting you know, the largest lithium mine, or we ship it to China, and, we, and they, have, they have, have the option of not selling it back to us through an embargo or otherwise. Well, uh, what I will say is that, for example, I know that President Biden reinforced kind of a Cold War Defense Protection Act uh, that is pushing forward federal power to be able to uh, really invest more in mining and production. So he's trying to find creative solutions, and actually this is something that President Trump did as well. So they're aware of what's going on, and it actually has bipartisan support, fortunately, uh, which we can't say for everything. So let's go. Good morning. Thank you for your presentation. I just had some clarification questions about um, supply chain control under the BRI. So does China have contracts or control over the major mining and the processing? So how exactly do they wield the influence? Yeah, so uh, while China is not the number one lithium miner or producer in the world, they do lead in production. So these are more supply chain contracts relating to production with Chile, with Argentina, with Bolivia. They haven't gotten into Australia yet, they likely never will, but they also have their own mine, which is I believe the third largest in the world in, the world in their Western provinces. So it's more centered on production, but that's because these countries have access to those mines. So they bring the lithium into China, Correct. refine it, and produce the batteries and distribute them. Exactly. And that's why a lot of our private partners like Tesla, like Ford, they have deals set up with China and that's its own security issue. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Eli from IWP and uh, I am International Center from Africa. And today I have a very quick question. Well, the 
depending on how you think about it. But uh, so uh, when it comes to China, they're very good when it comes to using government inefficiencies with these developing countries. And my question today is that what choice do to, to, uh, developing countries really have, especially particularly Africa? Uh, I have been in Africa ever since the second, the end of Second World War, but uh, not much of infrastructures have been built, not much of development has been done, and wars keep on happening. And then now China is coming in and this has also been critical with their trap diplomacy. And when during IMF uh, before China came in, some of the countries had debt that was almost more than their intended GDP by year. So it looks like you don't have much of a choice. And uh, when it comes to criticizing the both ends, what choice do you think that these developing countries have? Thank you very much. Not to go to doom and gloom again. Unfortunately, there's not a great deal of choice largely driven by our focus on renewable energy and developing renewable energy infrastructure, not just domestically, but internationally, because it's uh, it's, a, it's supposed to be a consolidated effort from everyone to be able to push that forward, but some countries can afford that type of innovation, some need more time. Um, from what I've seen, there have been efforts to set up private deals, so more focus on private industry rather than public sector, or over relying on the United Nations or United States. However, the, the main thing that we really need to do is if we're going to compete with China, we need to actually go out there and show up. So uh, that means stronger investment into these other countries like what China's doing. So replicate and what's working, keep pushing it forward. Thank you so much, Anthony, and uh, we'll let you go now. I know you have to be somewhere soon, but a really terrific presentation. Thanks so much. Now we uh, welcome uh, Amanda Verdun, who's an active uh, Coast Guard officer and has, I think we'll move from terrestrial problems with China to something that's more maritime based. Yes, thank you, Dr. Uh, good morning, I'm Amanda Verdun. I'm a Coast Guard Intelligence Officer and I'm a full-time student at the National Intelligence University. And I will be talking to you today about how the great power competition is being impacted with climate change and how ports in the Belt and Road Initiative are the cause of that. So the Belt and Road Initiative, the China's point of view on this is a new, do you have to click Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. There we go. Okay, I apologize. Thank you. Um, so as you can see here, you can see on the map what the Belt and Road Initiative is, and specifically my, my talk is on ports, the Maritime Slope Road, which is indicated in blue, which I now see is a blue on blue. But We'll move forward. Um, so China's point of view on the new Silk Road is to connect the world through modernized trade routes. This grand strategic plan called the Belt Road Initiative acts simultaneously as an international forum for development and interconnection as an instrument for Chinese power and influence. Sounds all great and positive from the Chinese perspective, right? So one of their main goals is to supplement regional development through economic integration. Second is to improve Chinese industry while exporting these same improved industrial standards. And China seeks to maintain its status of exponential growth to compete on the world stage as a global superpower, especially with overseas bases being co-located with these BRI ports. So now transitioning to ports. China is the number one in terms of ports. And one of the main concerns with this is what they will have control over when their bases are co-located and sea lines of communication and what they own in these other countries. So previously, when this third first started in 2013, when President Xi Jinping started this initiative, majority of the world was on board with the BRI and largely optimistic for its success as a global in integration initiative. The U.S. maintains a staunch opposition to the Belt and Road Initiative, refusing to back down from a great power competition because they will take over for a diplomatic information, military, and ec economic world. Most of the nations part that are participating in the Maritime Silk Road have a huge trade imbalance, as I know Anthony discussed previously with China. Beijing's investments are frivolous and inadequately planned in most cases. While a growing realization about broader economical, political, and security implications of large-scale Chinese investments. So these Chinese state-owned enterprises are investing in these ports and they are uh, conducting debt trap diplomacy for countries of concern. For my study, I will be focusing on three specific ports. The first port I will discuss is Khalifa. It is in the UAE and is of great importance to the US because there are ports 
that there are reports of a secret Chinese military facility in the area, but the exact location is unknown. And these ports are of high concern to military for the U.S. The second port that I'm focusing on is Udar, Pakistan. It directly impinges, impinges, impinges on the issue of sovereignty and territorial integrity of India. Strategic location and the role it plays in geopolitics in the region. The Indian Ocean is becoming the center of economic and strategic attention in global geopolitics and competitive and complex interests. The coastlines that are surrounding the, the port in Gwadar, reportedly from Climate Central, can potentially be underwater by 2060. So with that, what is China doing with this? Djibouti is the third port that I will be focusing on in my research. It is the anchor of China's maritime silk road. It connects the Red Sea to the Indian Ocean, and it will help connect Africa. So there's my background on Belt Road Initiative and the ports that I'll be focusing on. Now, how do we look at this from a climate change perspective? We all know that climate change has no borders, right? So we have to figure out how to tackle this problem. And of course, it is a concern for the great power competition. So ports specifically are very vulnerable to climate change since sea level rise impacts coastal regions. There are assessments that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, have on these climate change models. There are models that indicate across the globe that sea level rise will, will upwards of one meter by 2050, which is a major concern to port infrastructure. There is a risk modeling framework for port infrastructure that is adopted by the IPCC. This risk is a function of hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. Addressing the lower and upper bounds of climate change and looking at this at a lens of what is the best case scenario and what is the worst case scenario of how these ports will be impacted if sea level rises and storms increase and flooding continues. For my studies, I will be looking at the lowest, the lowest level of the RCP, which is the representative concentration pathway, which is a greenhouse gas concentration if we, can, if we lower our emissions into the future. There's a system that is called World Port Index that goes into detail as to how much estimated uh, infrastructure damages there are. For Djibouti specifically, there is a 13.04 million US dollars per year by the year 2050. So my question is, how is this impacting China and how are they, how will they plan to invest? Considering they're already putting these state-owned enterprises into every country and they're already uh, putting countries in debt trap diplomacy. And all this, all for, for this specific port is specifically due to, to coastal flooding. The Red Sea and the Persian Gulf ports are most exposed to high temperatures and will experience a high number of disruptions as a consequence of extreme temperatures. So then we also have to look at what will be the supply chain impacts that climate change will have. I mentioned the lower end, end of the spectrum. On the highest end of the spectrum, for if climate change continues to to worsen throughout the years, for my for my poor example in Djibouti is 16.76 million U.S. dollars per year. So again, how will China do this? Now, if China chooses not to invest invest in these ports and adaptations for ports, how can the U.S. take this as an advantage to move forward since China has globalized? their ports with the Belt and Road Initiative. I'm looking at this through a diplomatic information, military, and, and economic lens. Ports are a catalyst for economic development as they enable trade and support supply chains. My, re my thesis research will be completed by the June of 2024, so I'm still undergoing this research, but I feel like I have a big question to answer, and I, I know that we are in a nascent stage when it comes to climate change impact supports, but when it comes to great power competition, I think this is something that's that's very important that hasn't been thoroughly analyzed. And I welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. I think we'll uh, do the three presentations and then uh, take questions in case you want to ask questions to more than one. So next up is Johnny Davis from the National Intelligence University. Good afternoon, or, oh, no, we're still good morning. 
Um, I'm Johnny Davis. I'm an NIU student. I am also a uh, Army Reserve JAG. My presentation is going to be on modern day cognitive warfare. I'm going to focus on cognitive warfare between China and the United States, particularly focusing on the strategic level. Now, what is cognitive warfare to begin with? Well, you see the definition up there. I'll summarize the first part for you. Basically, those things done to shape the thinking and actions of individuals and groups, especially groups, because the best way to influence an individual is to give, man has a nasty herd instinct. And so you influence the group they identify with to go in a certain direction. 90% of the time or more, you get the individual to go in that same direction. The second part, I really want to make sure you take in deeply. Cognitive warfare seeks to modify perceptions of reality. It's whole of society manipulations to become a new norm. And so the directive thinking cognitively as a group, as a culture, as an individual is at stake here. Now, cognitive warfare isn't new. Sun Zoom's talking about messing with the mind of your uh, opponent. I'll go on. Um, but what's different is with the technology we have today, it allows for day-to-day -day cognitive warfare operations not only to occur, but they do occur. Were you on the internet today? You experience cognitive warfare. You have a cell phone, you've been seeing pop ups, you're experiencing cognitive warfare. And what you don't realize is how much often what you were hearing was actually Chinese um, operations were influencing you. And you may think that's impossible because you may say to yourself, Well, I'm rabidly anti CCP, so I know they're not influencing me. Do you believe that the other half of the country that votes for a presidential candidate? You didn't vote for is your enemy. Thinking thanks you. You're repeating a Chinese a cognitive warfare operational message. In fact, one of their most important key operations. Because that's what they're doing. They have, and one of the most important things China has going for them is they have a clear, coherent, strategic message that every part of their government is involved with. I'm going to go over the different methods they have. They use all these methods to drive forward consistently that same strategic message, even when they don't directly repeat it. It always is going to be a subset of the same strategic message, as well as it's occurring at the operational and tactical levels. And that's really going to be my bottom line up front. That's our great weakness. But I have a proposed solution, and I'm going to start hitting at it because I want to briefly take you back to the Founding Fathers because I'm going to end with the Founding Fathers because they actually have our solution for us. But I'm going to get to that one set of time. One of the founding fathers' key principles that we've very much forgotten is that character is destiny for nations and individuals. Well, cognitive warfare is a great national character test at the end of the day. But we all are experiencing it. But all ultimately our own individual characters that are being tested as well such as by the example I just stated. You get to start recognizing, we all have to get start recognizing these things and rise above that petty sectarian thinking and recognize who the real enemy is, which is both our own bad devices we've been done because everything that I've discussed China is doing is they are exploiting existing problems that we already did and helping us our own destruction. So it's gotta be recognizing our own individual responsibility as well as Xinping and the CCP are really our enemies. And ultimately, they're the enemy of all mankind, because the Chinese people are not our enemy. Now, their strategic message, what exactly is it? It's very easy to summarize. China's rising. China's invincible. The course of history is on their side. And their ascension to being the great power is inevitable. But not only that, they're claiming they do believe in America's rule-based order system. They're not like Russia that won't, that's openly wanting to overturn the rules-based system. They say they're for it, but the difference is 
The United States is a nation in decline. It's very corrupt. And as a corrupt, declining nation, they're stirring up trouble and problems that are affronting the rule-based order because they're trying to deal with their own national decline in a way that hurts the world. And therefore, the sooner China takes its rightful place as the leader of the rules-based order, stability will be restored and mankind will be advanced. And ultimately, everything you'll hear will advance this two-part message, the proactive greatness of the CCP and the national decline of the United States ultimately drive everything else they do and gets repeated. And that does tell us nat uh, naturally with the message they keep repeating in fact in the United States. Dickery, through their social media operations, they thought you've heard about. That's all true. I don't have time to go delve deeply in that. I'm keeping it strategic level, but I would emphasize it's not just part of TikTok. TikTok is where they get the most vigorously expound all these things on steroids. But they're going after every social media platform. It's social media theory. So I don't care if you don't go on TikTok, you go on Facebook, whatever, you are still experiencing their message. The key thing is, it's the pull of the extremes on both sides, emphasize Americans blaming other Americans for their problems, rather than recognizing the truth. We're in the same boat together, and to where we have gone wrong, and crosses blue and red, it's American mistake problem. It's not one of the half of the country, it's the other half of the country. I'm going to go get more in our, what our message needs to be later. But it doesn't stop with the social media. It goes into pop culture. They've essentially blocked, uh, blackmailed Hollywood into, you can't make any movies that we don't approve of unless we get our thumbs up. So you're not, not only you're not going to make any anti-Chinese movies, the green blockbusters are going to miss out on our wonderful market. It goes deeper. It's where in movies, uh, you're going to actually find maps where the maps on the South China Sea and Taiwan are, are the maps China uses, not the actual lawful, internationally law recognized maps. These things add up in shaping us and giving us false norms. And it's ultimately about trying to break our will. Because the will, in cognitive warfare, I would argue it's ultimately the most important theater of combat. It's about breaking our will, and especially the conflict with China. Because all the war game scenarios agree. China's great potential would bloody our nose. But if we go long and say we're going to pay the price it takes to beat China war, we succeed. So it's a will question. Therefore, cognitive warfare is a struggle to break our will. And that means both ways. In trying to deter China, the most important thing is to defeat them cognitively so they'll know they haven't broken our will. We are going to do what it takes to beat them if they start a war with China, with Taiwan, or any other act of aggression. Then we have a 95% chance they're never going to do it because they know they're going to lose. And as well as if we fight it, well, if we get really bloodied and we know it's going to be a huge price, we've got to be prepared to pay that price because we understand we have something worth fighting for, which again, I'm hinting at, or well, we're going to have to go strategically. And the news manipulation. And news manipulation isn't just about, you know, going with, Thai, with China's line. It does take that form where you have people saying Taiwan's not fighting for and then even dovetails their undue influence on businesses. They use those relationships, like with Tesla and Musk, to get Musk now to be on social media, repeating, oh, the U.S. shouldn't fight for Taiwan. You should just kind of deal with Taiwan, basically. Let them have Taiwan. You've got the investors in TikTok, like, yes, who is now becoming a de facto lobbyist for the CCP. And he's the number one reason it hasn't already been banned because he's thrown around a lot of money in DC. But, but part of but probably the greatest example of their cognitive warfare is the fact that he can do that. They've influenced us so much that it's still acceptable and respectable for a major US businessman to be basically flagrantly serving the interests of the CCP. And he can give big bucks to candidates, and those candidates aren't being roasted alive for doing so. 
it's very unparalleled in our American history that we've reached that point. And you even have athletes being co-opted to spread their message using like the Nike relationship. But again, all these things come together uh, to serve their messages, just as the operational tactical, like pushing Hamas's propaganda, trying to undermine our support for Israel. And that does tell us that to the larger messages, because they want to say that it's all because the United States is in decline. So the key is to have a correct strategic message. Well, what is that strategic message? It's the proven strategic message of the founding fathers that we used in the American Revolution, the Civil War, over to the Cold War, but principles of the Declaration, the unique founding of America, that all mankind has equal individuals as worth, that's the source of our rights, that's the source of self-governance. This must be our focus. This should be in our national strategic strategy instead of this empty talk about democracy versus authoritarianism that currently is in it, which doesn't even dovetail with reality. We have authoritarian allies and that lumps Russia, the United States, in together. And it also fails to recognize what it's about. Democracy is the form we use to protect self-governance and to carry out the self-governance of individual rights. But the center of gravity of the American Republic is that individual worth, that equal individual worth with individual rights and self-governance of people. It's not the elections. It's not federalism. Those are all good things but they are the tools to hold it. We get to get back in sync with the principles, and that gives us the great strategic message to rally us beyond our divisions because this cuts back beyond Democratic and Republic and, and Republican and reminds us when they're saying both together and reminds us we have something worth dying for, fighting for, and living for. And it's also a message to the world that the United States built on those principles is not a threat to you because those principles say we don't think less of you because you're from Congo or Mexico because you have the same equal value as well. And that is the self-evident rights that the Founding Fathers recognized. The Founding Fathers already told you that's a self-evident truth that everyone can recognize. But democracy is not it. But that is it. And with that right strategic message, if we will employ that and vigorously state it out in all our operations and let it drive us, and combine that with getting on to the tech companies to make sure we find a way to penetrate the firewall so the Chinese people can hear it as well, we can win the cognitive warfare, and in doing so, avoid a war with China, and if it happens anyway, winning it. Presentation and then we'll be open for questions. Carlos. Uh, oh. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, or good afternoon, sorry. Uh, today I'd like to talk about something that was the basis for a strategy paper that I produced at, while I was at IWP uh, with uh, Professor Rhodes. So I was assessing the PLA's activities and capabilities in the space domain. And this research provided a lot of insight into China's ambitions for operating in space. So that's what I'm going to present. Uh, the points that I list, uh, they have a lot of national security and intelligence gathering implications for the US. And so I hope you enjoy it. So let me set the stage first. Um, actually, let me go back. China's advancements in space technology and orbital operations are second only to the U.S. Even though China has conducted quite a bit of IP theft, China's space program has set a very impressive timeline of space launch milestones and met every spacefaring goal for the past 30 years. This is all under the guise of scientific research. So using the strategy of military civil fusion, right? any dual use technology can be controlled by the PLA. Uh, this means that Chinese commercial satellites can potentially be used for military applications. So what are the ch what are China's ambitions in, in space? And uh, I, I have five main points that I'm gonna list with just three slides. So the first one is uh, deny competitors or adversaries maybe access to space. But how does the military deny access to space? Well, you target 
their satellites. Um, according to the PLA military strategy, the U.S. military is unmatched and relies heavily on space to enhance its capabilities. This is what the PLA thinks. They believe that the U.S. military is unmatched and uh, we, use the US, uh, we use space to really enhance our uh, and support our ground forces. So the PLA believes they can't achieve parity with the U.S. in space anytime soon. So the only way to successfully counter U.S. space dominance is to develop counter space weapons for anti-satellite purposes. And I might say ASATs, that's basically what anti, anti satellite is, ASATs. So these could be used in a conflict to degrade or deter U.S. satellites such as ISR, Intelligence Surveillance Reconnaissance, BNT, to get position navigation and timing, or even missile tracking systems. Um, the point would be to knock out the U.S. Uh, advantage before the U.S. gets into a conflict or intervenes. So, as you can see, there are four main types. Sorry, bad habit, I wouldn't point this way. There are four main types when it comes to ASAT weapons, and I can't go into each right now. Uh, just know that China has performed various examples of each of these in the last 15 years. Uh, the next point that I want to highlight is that China really wants to establish a permanent presence in orbit, and uh, this was actually fully realized in 2021 with the, complete, the completion of the Tiangong Space Station, which uh, is going to be in orbit long after the ISS, the International Space Station, deorbits within the next 10 years or so. The next one I want to highlight uh, is the Cislunar region. Um, China wants to control the strategic points in the Cislunar region. What is the Cislunar region? Okay, it's the area from the Earth to the Moon. It's the Earth orbits, the Moon orbits, and all of the Lagrange points. And you can see in this moving picture that there are five points there, L1 to L5. Just a quick oversimplification of what are Lagrange points. When you have two bodies, when you have the Earth, let's say the Earth is the big orb, the Moon is the small orb, there are five points between those areas where the gravity between those two bodies makes a neutral, stable point where you can place something in that point with very, very little fuel. Um, that's amazing. We did this with the James Webb Space Telescope. It's a million miles from Earth on one of the Lagrange points, and that's why it's stable, taking beautiful pictures of the universe and sending it back to the US. But someone else did this too. They put a satellite in the L2 Lagrange point, and that was China. When China launched the Chang'e 4 lander on the far side of the moon, that's an incredible engineering achievement. Um, but there was a question, how are we gonna communicate with the rover? It's on the other side of the moon, you can't see it. Well, it was solved because they put COM relay satellite in the L2 point behind the moon. And there it sits, stable, communicating from Earth with the rover and the lander that's on the far side. And this was never done before. So now this is a concern. If this satellite can be used to communicate with the rover, it could also be used with that military solar fusion for military communications. And uh, this actually leads into the another area that China is interested in, which is establishing an outpost, a scientific outpost on the moon, the International Lunar Research Station, close to the South Pole. Now with this COM relay, the Trey Chow COM relay satellite, you have communications from the Earth to the South Pole. Uh, whether it's for scientific purposes or military purposes, how would we know? So the next slide, the next point, I would like to say is the future space economy. Uh, energy security and resource extraction, very, very important to China and to the PLA. Ultimately, the reasons for a permanent presence and an end-to-end -end supply chain in space is to control a future space economy and resource extraction that the PLA and the CCP perceive to be worth about 10 trillion annually by 2050. So if you look at each picture, I'll start with the top left. That is a picture of the uh, hydrogen, the frozen water deposits on the South Pole, which is conveniently where Russia and China are planning on constructing the ILRS, the International Winter Research Station. Uh, if you go down, the one below that is the deposits of, potential deposits for helium-3. Now, um, helium-3 is, is an interesting one. That's a highly sought after 
material that could provide an incredible source of energy using nuclear fusion. And we're not quite there yet, but still, it's something that is being sought after by a lot of companies and governments, uh, China included. The top right, that shows a new mineral that was brought back during the Chang'e 5 return mission. And that was being looked at as a potential energy source. It's called Chang'e Site Wise. It's very interesting. Uh, and the last picture shows a rendering of a space-based solar power platform. Um, and this is a really fascinating piece of technology. It's something that China is hoping to have. They want to have a 100 megawatt platform in geosynchronous orbit, providing continuous energy to China by the year 2050. So this is something they're trying to realize. And the last point I want to mention is that Xi Jinping stated this in the, in the 20th National Party Congress. China, they want to be a complete space power by 2045. That's what, several years from 2049, the 100th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. Uh, Xi Jinping believes that if China can establish itself as a leader in scientific and technological achievement in space, it'll enhance the reputation of the country, giving it a lot of diplomatic leverage. Um, so based on all these points, the PLA and the CCP see themselves in a race with the U.S. to control these areas for economic, defensive, and strategic purposes. All of these points have very relevant national security and intelligence implications for the U.S. Now, although China's actions in space are considered serious threats to the U.S., it's not too late to implement effective strategies to mitigate the risks these ambitions place on our interests. I didn't have time to go into the risks and strategies, but I did do that in the research paper. So I just want to highlight that what happens in the space domain in the next couple decades, well, within the next few years, actually, and who sets the norms and standards of behavior in space is really going to impact uh, this great power competition. So thank you for listening. how concise you were and stayed within time because I've just learned that we have to break at 12.15. So I'm going to just... Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to invite three questions uh, and then we'll have the whole panel, you know, please tell me if you want to address it to one person or to more than one person and then we'll wrap up and you can continue to converse with our panelists uh, in the during the break. So any questions? questions for Amanda. Um, you were talking about the risk to these ports that China's building about the climate change. Climate change doesn't really discriminate, right? The U.S. ports obviously are at risk as well. It seems to be more of a question of the ability to adapt to climate change as their infrastructure. How would you assess China's ability to adapt quickly to changes like that? Well, I really appreciate your question because as I was doing this research, is can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, as I was doing this research, I, I kept coming back to what about our board? Like, I felt like that was that was huge. Um, and unfortunately, in a lot of the research that I'm overcome that I'm looking at, I'm seeing what they're doing about their ports specifically in China, but not in the ones that they've invested in and how. So, unfortunately, I don't have an answer, but it is something I'm looking for. So, thank you. <coughs> Thank you. This question is for Carlos about, um, oh yeah, um, in terms of asteroid mining, I know there's been some ambitions like from Japan to pull um, one of the largest asteroids that comes pretty close to Earth into Earth's orbit in order to um, harvest <laughs> them. I know there's like, a, what is it, a $19 trillion entity. Is there any plans from China to um, harness those resources as well? Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, yes, this is actually something China's very interested in. Not just asteroid mining, but uh, mining on the moon, as I said, mining in other planets like Mars, that's a serious, that's a big focus. But as for the asteroid, um, I didn't see any specific documentation detailing taking an asteroid and bringing it into orbit. I know that they will be part of when uh, this Apophis uh, asteroid comes within what, 30,000 kilometers of Earth in 2029. China will be one of many countries sending probes 
to try to s just to see what type of minerals to assess uh, how they can go about utilizing that asteroid um, and the contents of it. So uh, it's a very fascinating area. Um, they haven't really poured any investment into private companies like the U.S. has with startups that are looking into mining asteroids. Um, but it's definitely a focus. So yes, thank you. So there's uh, not a last question. I'd like to ask a question to all the panelists about the kind of interface between intelligence and policy. What you're each describing really relies heavily on knowledge that's coming from industry, from perhaps trade policy, from so that look at how much we can talk about these technological issues in a completely unclassified way. So my question is, are there pieces of this that you think are uniquely in the responsibility of the intel community that, you know, the intel where collection, sort of secret collection would make a huge difference in our understanding of the problem? And how much of this, if you think about how the intelligence community interacts with policy, how much of this do you think is owned in that very special relationship where intel briefs the president or briefs you know, high-level officials. Um, and if you have any ideas on who would be the most eager policy customer for what you're working on, that would be, uh, I think, a part of the question. Anybody? Amanda, you want to I'll go first. Um, so, as we know, this administration is very much involved with seeing where climate change goes and how we can implement that. And I, I actually, after hearing the new, the climate change NIM discussed, I, I, I felt like we are now in a stage that this is something that will affect policy, but because climate change has been one of those things, we don't know what we don't know, so it hasn't been implemented. I feel like now is the time that people are starting to look at it, but people are talking, but there's no specific coordination as to how we're doing it. Just because, like, for one example, I had spoken with the PNNL about lab work on what they're looking at and they, they have classified, they have unclassified projects. However, when I spoke to one of the managers, they, they discussed with me that it was only based off of RFIs that were requested, but it wasn't a specific, oh, for Belt and Road Initiative ports, which is a concern for the US, how are we looking at this? So I think that we're we're moving in that direction, but it's, it's not there yet. Um, yeah, I think uh, in terms of the space domain, it's not just a defense issue uh, or national security uh, issue. It's also an intelligence issue because we have a lot of ISR satellites in Leo, which is low Earth orbit. And um, that is getting very, very crowded. And I think the more activities we conduct in, um, in space and the more governments and, and these non-state actors, you know, these private firms are going into space, um, we need to really, it's important to understand who's up there and what they're doing. And the only way you do that is with space domain awareness, that's on the defense side, or space situation awareness, which is on the public side. And so I believe um, it's really pertinent to intelligence. And I think this across the government, uh, there's no particular agencies uh, that wouldn't, there, there are a lot of agencies actually that would benefit from this. I mean, it was just not long ago that the Department of Commerce, they're in charge of space traffic management that was like shifted from the DOD to the Department of Commerce. So it's fascinating. I think uh, space is gonna be one of those areas, like a lot of other areas of emerging technologies where there's just gonna be a lot of involvement from right. many different areas. Good answer. I mean, both of those, I think, really lend themselves to very much whole of government. You could almost have a dozens of policy customers that would be interested in this work. It's not gonna be just uh, exclusively in the national security community. Obviously, cognitive warfare is a complete whole of government, but a particular area where the intelligence community can play a valuable role is artificial intelligence and quantum computing, doing collections on what China's developing there. Because those two things are going to transform the cognitive warfare because that big data that is not something you can in detail analyze and use well, artificial intelligence, quantum computing means you're going to be able to which means you're going to make accurate, detailed predictions on the behaviors of individuals, target groups using this big data, which means everything I was describing, you're going to be able to do it far, far better. 
far more dangerously and much more subtly than what's occurring today. So we've got to get hold of what they're doing as soon as possible. And so the signs, what I've already described, we got to get the strategic message right, because we don't do that right, operational stuff, no matter how good of a job we do, it isn't going to work. But besides strategic message, we've got to get our own algorithms doing real well, understanding theirs, the feet there, so that we implement and message our strategic messaging and our particular messaging on individuals and groups better than they do. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Aaron, I don't know if you have any final thoughts or instructions for the group, but I really thought it was a terrific panel. I want to just thank my panelists. <laughs>